Coming up on this episode, a look at the NBA playoffs as things currently stand, including a huge day for a former Warrior, plus some potential implications for Golden State, depending on the playoff outcomes, plus a look at Clay Thompson, the latest on his free agency as a veteran sharpshooter looks for a new deal in the offseason. Yes, welcome back to the Golden State with Mates podcast, where it's just gone 9 p.m., my time here in Australia on a day where there's a couple of extraordinary NBA playoff games that I'll get into. But uh, if you are a Warrior fan watching this, hope you are enjoying the first few days of the playoffs here as much as we can, given Golden State aren't involved, which is disappointing to a degree. However, I don't know. There's a there's a refreshness. There's a lack of anxiety and stressfulness that comes with your team not being involved in these high stakes games. And of course we want our teams to be involved, right? That is the beauty of sport. That is the beauty of following a team is, you know, getting down to the nitty gritty important time of the season. And it is very disappointing that the Warriors aren't there. However, there is a, a, a refreshing nature to being able to watch these games in some peace. <laughs> let's, let's put it that way in some peace. And for me, I wear my heart on my sleeve when I'm watching my favorite teams play. And, you know, I grew up in a household with my old man where, you know, we'd watch sport together and he'd just yell at the TV incessantly. And I would think he's an absolute dickhead. Uh, Think, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Think I'll never become that kind of guy. I feel like getting older now, and I mean, I'm only 27, but I feel like as I'm, as I'm getting older, I, I feel like I'm becoming that kind of person where, I do yell at the TV and think that I can somehow have an impact on what's going on in front of me, uh, which is, you know, not not great. But, uh, I mean, it is what it is, and it's the passion that we have for sport uh, and, for our, and for our sporting teams. Uh, off the NBA for a second, I remember AFL Grand Final last year with my team, Collingwood, playing, and I got a notification on my Apple Watch about 10 minutes into the game saying that my heart rate had exceeded 120 uh, and the Apple Watch actually came out with a concerning message saying your heart rate has exceeded 120 even though we have not detected exercise in the last 10 minutes. Uh, And so that kind of goes to show you where my heart rate gets to, where the blood pressure might get to when we're talking about high-stakes sport where everything is on the line and that's obviously what we've got in the playoffs at the moment. So as much as it's disappointing that the Warriors aren't there, uh, it's probably maybe better for my long-term health that they're, that they're not, uh, particularly given some of the moments they've put us through over the last decade, which has been hugely exciting, no doubt, but uh, also very stressful as well. Uh, but a former warrior I wanted to get started on today's episode, Dante DiVincenzo. Couldn't be happier for Dante uh, about 12 hours ago, or not, no, not 12 hours ago, about 10 hours ago now, he uh, sunk the Philadelphia 76ers with a huge three in the final 15 seconds to give the Knicks a game two victory. They looked dead and buried. They looked like they were gone, looked like the 76ers were going to tie things at one all going back to Philadelphia. They're up five with under 30 seconds to go. Jalen Brunson gets a sidestepping corner three to rim in very, very friendly bounce that goes in and then a kind of chaos ensues where the 76ers try and inbound the ball do so unsuccessfully. Tyrese Maxey kind of falls over. No foul, no timeout called, even though uh, Nick Nurse clearly was upset with the fact that there wasn't one called uh, in the the post game. Ends up in a Josh Hart steal. Dante's first attempt at three on the wing misses. Isaiah Hartenstein comes flying in for the rebound. He gets it out to OG Ananobi. And uh, Dante gets his second opportunity and makes amends, drilling the three-pointer, which gave him 19 points on 5 of 10 shooting, I think, in the game. Unbelievable. And couldn't be happier for Dante, who, let's be honest, if we just completely take the bias out of it from a Golden State perspective, he has put him himself in a much better position than what he was in with the Warriors last season. And that's a big thing to say, given he had a really good season for the Warriors. And I think the Warriors were good for him. He was good for the Warriors, vice versa. Uh, but he's taken his game to another level here, which I don't think he would have necessarily got to in the Bay. Uh, however, it's kind of ironic. And, and I'm not just saying this now after what he did today in what is one of the biggest shots in Nick's playoff history, one of the biggest moments in Nick's playoff history. 
But I've been saying it for quite a while now, given how well Dante shot the ball this season, given he finished third in the league in threes, made this season behind Steph and Luca. It's kind of ironic that the Warriors need or needed someone like Dante this season, where anyone that's listened to me over the last few months, I've been saying the Warriors really lack three-point shooting or lacked it as we go back on the season now and reflect. The Warriors lack three-point shooting beyond Steph and Clay, and I think put huge pressure on them in a manner that perhaps they didn't see coming given, you know, Wiggs' struggles to start the season, given Clay struggles himself to start the season, given Moody probably didn't play as much or as consistently as we would have liked. And I mean, the franchise has much of itself to blame for that one. Uh, but I've said all along, and I actually indirectly asked Steve uh, about it, to which he said that, you know, Wiggs and Moody are capable three-point shooters because, you know, the stats have backed it up that, you know, the Warriors had multiple players over the last few years, you know, going back to the 2022 championship season where they had got three, four, five players making at least two threes a game. Uh, and this season, they only had two. And I think Chris Paul might have been third. I don't know if Wiggs overtook him at the end of the season, but... Uh, yeah, not enough three-point shooting. And if they had Dante there, that would have obviously given them that kind of third level uh, of, of three-point shooting that they really, I mean, Dante was a better three-point shooter than Clay was this season. So it's quite remarkable to think about re- really his rise, uh, but couldn't be happier for him. He's, he's in a situation now where, let's be honest, he's having big moments in big playoff games for one of the most storied franchises in the NBA. He gets to do what he did today at Madison Square Garden, which, you know, I'm over here in Australia. I've only ever been to four NBA arenas. I've been to Staples multiple times. I've been to MSG. I've been to Chase, obviously. And I've been to Barclays Center in Brooklyn. And the the Knicks game I went to was the Knicks versus Pistons. Uh, It was the last game before COVID hit. And like, the following day was when Rudy Gobert did his touch the mic thing. Uh, but it was an unbelievable experience in a game that was horrific in terms of the players out on the floor. Like this is when Julius Randle was an okay player, but certainly not the all-star that he's kind of developed into. I'm trying to think who aim, I suppose, but he was injured. He was on the bench. Uh, Blake injured. Not sure if Andre Drummond was still there at the time, but he was either not there or injured. Uh, there was just a complete, like, I remember going into it as an Australian thinking, oh, yeah, cool. Like, the most intriguing player to me in this game is Thon Maker, who was playing for the Pistons. Real throwback, 10th overall pick from the Bucks back in the day. But, uh, yeah, the experience, regardless, at MSG was absolutely unbelievable. And I could not imagine, I mean, we can see it on TV, but I could not imagine being there in that environment when Dante hit that shot today and then Embiid misses at the buzzer. And, you know, the Knicks go on and win. So to be in that situation for, for Dante to be able to have those big moments, to have a significant role where he's playing, goddamn, nearly 40 minutes a night, it's it's a credit to him. Uh, and I think the Warriors deserve some credit for helping to get him to that situation. And I think there was an article earlier in the season about Steph kind of pushing Dante into New York. Obviously, the Warriors were pretty handicapped with what they could do in uh, free agency in terms of, you know, offering him a new contract. Uh, They were never going to be able to match what the Knicks did, but what the Knicks gave him, which is what, four year 48 or something like that, four year 50, whatever it was, is looking like an unbelievably team friendly deal. And the Knicks are doing all this obviously without uh, Julius Randle, who's been out injured for the second half of the season. And looks like they'll probably go on and beat the 76ers right now. Embiid, He's just 60. He said himself, he's 60 is 70% fit. It's hard to watch, and it's disappointing to watch because he's obviously one of the best players in the league. I do think the 76ers would be capable of winning this series if Embiid was 100% fully healthy. They should have won this game. Uh, Obviously, some controversial refereeing decisions, which the 76ers were less than pleased with in the aftermath. Uh, But it's disappointing that Embiid is clearly playing hobbled, and it's just the reality of his career, to be honest. And you have to wonder whether it's, you know, a a curse of him rather than a curse of the 76ers in terms of getting to this point in the postseason and not being able to, to take the next step. And I suppose, you know, for rival teams, is there a point where Embiid looks around, puts his hand up, Obviously, being able to pair a superstar center like him with Steph from a Warrior perspective would be incredibly intriguing. But, I mean, I keep watching him 
season after season and, you know, getting injured in these moments and not being able to perform at his best. And, you know, you do wonder as he continues to age, how much you'd be willing to give up in a trade for Joel Embiid. I personally wouldn't be giving up too many injury history, uh, given the playoff history of just not being able to be fully healthy at the right times. And it's really disappointing, but it's just the reality of, of where we're at. And then the other game kind of later on, I mean, we had three games. I'll get into the other one in a bit, but the obviously had the, the 76ers and the Knicks. And then we had the Lakers and Nuggets, which was just as, if not a better finish with Jamal Murray hitting the baseline jumper over Anthony Davis to lift the Nuggets to a one hundred one ninety nine victory after they were down by 20, I think in the third quarter. Uh, Look, there's kind of a saying, I suppose, that you can't judge a series until a road team has won a game or until both teams have played at home, which is, you know, there's similar sayings, I suppose, around, you know, all sport. I mean, for, if there's any cricket fans out there, any Australian cricket fans, whatever else, there's, there's always a saying, if you can't judge a pitch until both teams have batted, that kind of thing. But I do think in this situation with under... Underdog teams going in as seventh seeds in in the uh, in the Lakers and the 76ers, like you've got to take your opportunities, right? Especially for the Lakers against Denver, who are near flawless or at least you know a clear favorite to get through to the NBA Finals uh, out of the Western Conference. You've got to take your opportunities when they present them, and being up twenty having great games from LeBron and AD and D'Angelo Russell, who went off particularly in the first half. You get great games from those three guys. You get a pretty underwhelming game from Murray until the fourth quarter, or like even just the last three or four minutes, he finally began to heat up, but otherwise had a a pretty poor game. You just need to win that game if you're any chance of winning this series. And I just think, yes, like all that's happened is that the Nuggets and in – the, the Knicks case as well, they've held serve. But I think some losses can be heartbreaking ones that teams you know just can't come back from. And I fail to see how the 76ers and the Lakers could potentially come back from these losses. And I don't see a way in which they can win both games at home. I think both the Knicks and the Nuggets will steal at least one game in, uh, in Philadelphia. And Los Angeles, and then you know it's three one uh, at a minimum kind of thing, uh, and then you know two of the last three games back on the two seeds home floor. I just think these two games today for for the seventy sixers and the Lakers incredibly disappointing results. Where in a series you've just got to take those kind of opportunities, and if you don't, they can be situations you just cannot you know, wrestle back the momentum and you can't come back from. So uh, disappointing for the Lakers, disappointing for the 76ers. The Lakers, again, they they had great games from, I mean, AD went for over 30. LeBron had 26 and 12. I suppose the slight criticism you could say is maybe look for your shot more earlier in the game, like most of his points came in the fourth quarter, but still a great game from LeBron. We can't argue that. Uh, D'Lo, again, what, hit six or seven threes was huge, but they their bench is just woeful. Like, it just is. And if you're not getting a good game from Rui Hachimura as well, who had three points on one of seven shooting, and then you look at their bench and you're getting nothing out of Spencer Dinwiddie, you're getting nothing out of Gabe Vincent. Torian Prince hit a couple of threes, but teams aren't necessarily worried. And then you've got the Nuggets, who I don't think their bench is great either, to be honest, Uh, but they've definitely got guys that can produce more so than what the Lakers have, you know, Christian Brown goes for 10 points in 12 minutes today. We know Peyton Watson, whenever he's out there, is going to produce high-level defense. So they've got a couple of more guys you probably have more trust in, even like a guy like Reggie Jackson, who I'm not a huge fan of, but he does have playoff experience. He does have experience in a manner that the Lakers guys just don't. It's as simple as that. You know, you see a young guy like Jackson Hayes plays a few first half minutes, and then he's completely out of the rotation. In the second half, you just need huge games from AD, LeBron, D'Lo, and and even then, you might not win, and that's what happened today. So disappointing for the Lakers. Uh, the Cavs are magic. I don't want to talk about this series. I watched most of that game today. Well, I was kind of flicking between the Knicks and the 76ers game and the Cavs magic game, but it was – I mean, I was talking with a mate about it this afternoon. Orlando's offense is just deplorable. It really is. Like, you've got a pretty good Cleveland defense, no doubt. They're just kind of smothering Paolo, making things really difficult for him. It's his first – 
postseason, uh, first playoff series, and he's you know struggling a little bit under the weight of that, which is expected. Like he's still young; it's his second year in the league. You know, this is kind of bound to happen, and it's, I think it's just a learning experience for Orlando. And I, I don't see them coming back and beating Cleveland, uh, even though I don't think the Cavs are any good. <laughs> I actually, I really don't think they're any good. I just think Orlando, like they just don't have the offense. They don't have the guys that can take advantage of the kind of gravity that Paolo can provide, who I've really been impressed with his kind of playmaking development. And they just don't have guys that can knock down shots around him. They don't have that kind of secondary con- uh, secondary shot creation. You know, Franz can do it a little bit, obviously, but he's been fairly inefficient the first two games here. So you can see why, and I, we'll get into it later on, but you can see why they're certainly interested in, in Clay and potentially adding him to the mix because they just don't have the necessary shooters that it takes to to win series like this where, you know, it's a dogfight kind of thing and you need guys to be able to take advantage when your star player is, is getting smothered and double teamed and harassed and whatever else. So disappointing for them. Uh, again, I mean, there's... I would give them more chance, I suppose, than I would either the Lakers or the 76ers, as weird as that sounds, just because I I don't think Cleveland are good. And this is the way I would put it, is I'm looking at this Cleveland team, I'm watching them play, and no no disrespect, but I actually think if they came up against every Western Conference playoff team, everyone in the top eight, that includes the Lakers at seven, the Pills at eight, every Western Conference team, I would back every Western Conference team against the Cavs in a seven-game series. and we're going to get Cleveland in the second round of playoffs. And I think that's I think that's disappointing. I think that's disappointing. If you're ever going to make an argument, if you're ever going to make an argument about, you know, not having conferences or anything like that when it comes to the postseason, I think you can make the argument that, you know, the Cavs are going to be one of the last four teams in the Eastern Conference. They're going to be in the second round of the playoffs. And there's probably at least eight, at least eight Western Conference teams that are better than Cleveland. And, if I really wanted to get bold with it, and I'm not going to, actually, I bugger it, I am. Like, would the Warriors have a chance against this Cleveland team? Yes. Yes, they would. Would Sacramento have a chance against this Cleveland team? Yeah, they would. <laughs> they would. And so we're we saying that there might be 10 Western Conference teams that are better than a team that's going to make the second round of the playoffs in the East. Yeah, th- there might be. That's. I'm sorry, that's just what it is. I don't like this Cleveland team at all. I don't. I I don't really like the Mobley Allen combination, although they've both been good in these two games. The Mitchell Garland combination. There's too much there's too many times where they just take turns. Like it's not a really it's not really a basketball fit for me. It's like, all right, possession by possession, you take the ball this time. No, you take the ball this time. Obviously they stagger their minutes. I get it. Um and maybe I, I haven't watched enough Cleveland basketball to really properly assess. Uh, and there's going to be Cavs fans out there if they potentially listen to this that are going to get mad about it. That's fine. I I honestly think they're just that they're, they're not very good for a team that's going to make the second round of the playoffs. Um, that's just what I think. Uh, anyway, we'll move on from that. Uh, other so that were the three games today. Obviously, the uh, rest of the series in the East. I mean, Heat Celtics. <laughs> Complete mismatch. Uh, I think the Celtics would probably win in five, if not sweep, even if Jimmy was healthy. And now with no Jimmy, it's just, it's a mismatch. I'm sorry. Like, yeah, we saw what the Heat were able to do to the Celtics and perhaps the mental edge that they've got over them from the Eastern Conference Finals last season. But I think with, you know, Drew Holiday coming in, with Porzingis coming in, like the Celtics, it's much a much better team now they just are and so it doesn't really matter what kind of mental edge is there I, I still think it doesn't it doesn't lessen the gap enough for this to be anywhere near close and it's so it's just a mismatch to me and you know we'll wait and see it's only been one game but you know Celtics win by 20 very comfortable no Jimmy Butler yeah I just don't think it's I don't think it's a a series that <laughs> too too many people are, are keen to to catch because I think you know, we'll just wait and see what happens moving forward with the Celtics. But I, yeah, they're too talented. They're just too good for this uh, for this Miami team. Uh, Bucks paces the other series. Bucks got a fifteen point winning game one without Giannis. Dame had a huge first half. Middleton played well. Uh, obviously, those two guys are going to be the keys. Clearly, without Giannis, uh, the interesting thing here from a Warrior perspective is just to bring Golden State back into it. Uh, Brian Windhorst kind of reported um, 
last week or week before or whatever, that if there's another first round exit here for the Bucks on the back of going out to the Heat last season in the first round, then maybe there's a chance that Giannis looks around where you could question where his future lies, even though he signed an extension what, at the start of this season, his contract for another four years, I believe, something like that. Clearly, like if there's a way that the Warriors are going to revitalize this and rediscover their championship contention, the best pathway to do doing that is to get Giannis Antetokounmpo. Like that is the dream, right? That is the absolute dream. Like, Stopping short of that, you might look at, okay, is there, can you reunite with KD? But even if you do that, KD's 35 years old, nearly 36 years old. Like, he's not in the absolute prime, prime of his career anymore. Still a very good player like Steph. Very, very high-level elite, potentially top 10 player in the league still. But he's going to be on the decline in the coming years. Giannis has still got years in his prime. Giannis has still got years in his prime. So if there's a way to kind of revolutionize the Warriors. That's it. That's it. That is going to grab the second, third, fourth best player, whatever you want to say in the NBA. Simple as that. And so uh, we'll just wait and see. But I think if you're a Warrior fan, I think you'd be praying for the Bucks' downfall. That's fine. I, I, as much as I like Giannis, I want to see him succeed. I want to see him succeed at the Warriors. That would be the ideal prospect. So... From that perspective, you'd have to be hoping for the Bucks to fall into pieces again, and then and losing the first round again, and wait and see what happens. Uh, I do think that they'd actually move on from Dame again first beforehand, but I don't know if Dame's been kind of playing silly buggers the whole season and kind of mucking around, and then now that it's come down to serious time, we saw in Game One he was absolutely on fire, and and maybe he's, he's can kind of flick a switch in a way that some of the superstars can come playoff time, but uh, not a series that really needs to be talked about too much aside from the uh, the Giannis injury, obviously, and the potential implications of what happens if the Bucks were to fall in round one. On the west side of things, uh, Mavs, Clippers, Clippers, good win. Game one, Mavs didn't play overly well. Uh, I do think that, that Mavericks will still win. I, I think they'll win tomorrow, or it'll be today by the time you guys are hearing it if you're in the US. Uh, I think... Luca and Kyrie, I just have more faith in them as like killers on the playoff stage kind of thing, uh, as opposed to James Harden and Paul George and who the hell knows what's happening with Kawhi Leonard. I do think that Kyrie and I just, I just feel like I have more trust in them in a playoff setting than the Clippers key guys. However, they're going to need someone else to step up because obviously those two guys played reasonably well both had 30 plus points in game one and they still lost by double digits and so you're going to need like pj washington to hit some shots you're going to need tim hardaway jr to hit some shots you're going to need gaffin and lively to be a lot better against zubuck you can't have zubuck beating him up like he did in game one and so i do expect dallas to win however again we'll get into it in a minute like they've had interesting clay as well and you can see based on game one why that is the case as well. Uh, and then Thunder Pelicans, the last one. Like, this is, this might be the most exciting series. Now, it's a real shame about Zion. A real shame because if Zion was fit and healthy, Pelicans could really win this series. And I'm not saying it would be like, I'm not saying I'd pick them. I'm not saying they'd be favorites. But it would be, it'd, it'd be close to 50 50. It'd be close. I wouldn't be betting on the Thunder. Let's put it that way. So it's a real shame about his injury. Uh, a little bit, a bit, a little bit like Embiid. It's kind of just becoming the norm, unfortunately, for Zion. Uh, I know he's obviously a lot younger than Embiid. He's still got plenty of time, but it's really, really disappointing because you know he was huge in that playoff game, play-in game against the Lakers, which they lost. Uh, and then really disappointed they lost Game One because that was again going back to kind of these underdog teams who need to take the opportunity when they're there. And they had a really a really big opportunity in game one against a Thunder team who I kind of saw what I expected, young, inexperienced, a little bit nervous on the on the playoff stage potentially. Uh, but they were able to get through that and they were able to get a win. And I think that's going to bode well for them moving forward where they can probably just relax a little bit now, get into the series and probably take control in a way that a one seed should take control. 
up it again, I don't think they necessarily would if Zion was out there fully healthy. So I, I expect the Thunder to win the series. Uh five or six games probably. But again, if it was if Zion was there, I think it would go maybe seven. I, I would I'd pick a seven game series there and then it's kind of up in the air. So really disappointing about Zion injury. Just one thing on the Thunder. I again I I don't think they'll do anything uh too substantial in terms of, you know, I don't think they're gonna make the NBA finals. I don't think they're getting out of the West by any means. However, I do think that they missed an opportunity by not pushing their chips in further to trying to make uh, the NBA Finals, and, and when, once you get to the Finals, you could win a championship kind of thing. And I think it's really disappointing that the only thing they did at the deadline was bringing Gordon Haywood, who's done very, very little for them. And I've been saying it for probably over six months now. I, as an Australian who you know obviously watches Josh Giddy pretty closely, I don't think Josh Giddy should be on the Thunder by any means. I don't think he should have been on the Thunder at the start of the season. I don't think he'll. I, I don't think he'll be on the Thunder by the start of next season. I'm putting that out there. I I just look at him. He plays, what do you have, three points, two rebounds, two assists in game one, played less than 20 minutes. Uh, why would you have a guy out there who is, he's won, like he's got multiple elite skills, but you, he needs the ball in his hands to be really effective, to distribute, to handle the ball. And if you're not going to give him that opportunity, which the Thunder just can't because you're going to give the ball, you're going to put the ball in the hands of Shea, you're going to put the ball in the hands of Jalen Williams. Like, that's just what you're going to do. Like, I understand. It's not the Thunder's fault. It's just the situation that they're in where, like, of course you're not going to play Josh for many minutes because if you've got a guy who you need to play a kind of 3 and D role, that's completely against the kind of archetype that Josh is. Like, he's not a 3 and D type at all. He can't really shoot very well at all. Uh, and he's not the greatest defender in the world, albeit he's long. So, of course, you can have Kaysom Wallace out there for plenty more minutes than you are Josh Giddy. And I actually think, like, if you're moving forward in this series, if you're a, if you're a bit of a gambler, like, you'd be taking Josh Giddy's unders. I don't, I don't know what they're set up for tomorrow's game. Or are they playing? To, I don't even know if they're playing tomorrow or the following day. I haven't checked yet. Uh, but you'd be taking the unders. Like, you just would be, depending on what it is, because... Obviously, like I just don't see him. He played 19 minutes in game one. I'd be surprised if he played more than 16 or 17 in game two. I just think he'll play less and less because I, he doesn't fit in this team in any way. And I would have, it's a real shame, I think, for OKC that uh, he, the, the whole investigation with him came up at a time it did. Because I would have, at that point, I would have been looking to trade him. And it's just nothing against Josh. It's nothing against the Thunder. It's just the situation of the type of player he is and the construct of the team. That's like as simple as that. And you look at the young players that they've got. They're going to have to, they've got a couple of years, yeah, but they're going to have to pay Jalen Williams. They're going to have to pay Chet. They can't pay all these young guys. And I think Josh is still, you know, he could be looking at a hundred plus million dollar contract. I just don't think OKC are going to pay that. I don't think they're going to pay that. And I think they needed to get the value out of him at the start of the season uh, before the whole investigation thing happened, I suppose. They need to get the, the trade value out of him then rather than wait till now where I think his trade value has dropped quite significantly because teams are looking at a guy who doesn't shoot the three ball overly well and isn't the greatest defender in the world. And you kind of have to put the ball in his hands for him to be effective what kind of player do we have it out of suppose? I think he can be a really solid player and a really good player in this league. Hopefully a starting level player, you know, for many years going forward. But I do I do think that the Thunder missed a trick a little bit by not trading him. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a warrior link there as well, given that he would have uh, been taken at seven if, he, if the Thunder didn't snap him up at six. Uh, I, yeah, interviewed Josh's dad, Warwick, uh, a couple of years ago. In fact, just after the draft, before his first season in the league. And uh, and he said that Golden State had, t- had said to him that they would take him at pick seven. Uh, obviously, the Thunder came in and, and took him at six. But there's always the thought there of what Josh Giddy would look like on this Warrior team. Early days, I thought it would be it'd be good. Now, as Josh has de- Josh's career has kind of developed, there's kind of a correlation between him and Draymond a little bit in terms of like similar height. Don't don't shoot the ball overly well, or at least teams don't respect them from three. Uh, Draymond's obviously a much better defender. Josh is a really good rebounder. Uh, Josh probably just handles wise uh, is a lot better. Uh, Josh 
is he a better scorer than Draymond? Yeah, probably. So I just think there's too many, there's too much overlap in those two games to be working efficiently at the Warriors right now. If uh, if Josh was actually drafted to Golden State, so as much as early days Josh was incredible, you know, recording triple doubles and whatever else, and you thought, you know, geez, I wish we had Josh over JK. I think Warriors fans should be pretty happy that they've got, uh, well, we've got Kaminga. Still on the rush now. Uh, I think that's about it. I, I think the other thing from a Thunder perspective is you saw Valanciunas beat him up in game one. Again, if you're looking at a giddy trade, even during this offseason coming up, can you try and get a a genuine big man, like a bruising big man, like an old school big man kind of thing? Like I'm looking at guys that have been traded over the last 12 months. There hasn't been many big guys traded, I think. If you look at a guy like Gafford, but even then, you know, Gafford didn't have a great game one for the Mavericks. Even the guy he played against, Zubak, if you could kind of add him. Uh, funnily enough, like if you go back to, you know, a few years ago with the Thunder and Stephen Adams, I think Stephen Adams, a guy like that would be, you know, obviously he's been injured over the last couple of years, but, you know, Stephen Adams for a few from a few years ago, I think he would be quite good. On the Thunder, you know, a guy that can just be really physical, uh, can help address their rebounding issues for you know, 12, 15 minutes a night. Obviously, they're going to want to play Chet at center the majority, but I do think Chet's obviously got a skill set where you could play him at the four next to another big guy at the five. I think it's obviously just a thing that they're going to have to wait and see what happens for the rest of the playoffs, but then look ahead to come the offseason because they have got a stack of draft picks that they could absolutely do anything with. They Anyone that becomes available, they can really get into the ballpark of. Uh, we'll finish up there in terms of the playoffs. I uh, hope you guys continue to enjoy the playoff action, even if the Warriors aren't involved. Uh, let's talk about Clay for a second and kind of the latest reports on him over the last week since the conclusion of the Warriors season. So I think I spoke about on last episode, like, the season-ending press conference the day after that disaster against the Kings wasn't great from a, a Clay perspective, very kind of defensive, wanting to look at the present rather than the future, kind of biting back at Anthony Slater in his opening question there. I think if you went into that thinking, you know, wanting reassurance that Clay is going to re-sign with the Warriors, you probably came out concerned. Uh, and then obviously, you know, we've still got, a couple of months here till Francis. So there's going to be a lot of speculation that goes on. Clearly, uh, Orlando continue to be the team that makes the most sense and is, you know, being the most strongly linked to Clay. Should he actually look at departing the Warriors? Uh, makes sense for the reasons I kind of outlined before in terms of what they're doing at the moment against the Cavs, where they really lack three point shooting. Uh, they need someone like Clay who can knock down shots, can take advantage of, you know, the the defense when you know they collapse on Paolo, even France at times attacking the rim because those guys are, you know, six eight, I think France is six eight, Paolo's six ten, you know, downhill they're really hard to stop. So defenses are going to collapse on them and right now they just don't have the outside shooters to be able to take advantage of that. So it's clear as they even though Clay had zero points on zero of ten shooting last week against the Kings, you know his second half of the season was really strong, nearly twenty points a game and over forty one percent three point shooting. So he is going to be a player to watch from a Magic perspective. Uh, they've got room in their cap to be able to offer him big money, and that's obviously I think still going to be a big factor for him. You could argue that they're closer to championship contention than the Warriors are now. And I think the big thing for Clay is clearly, like, I think the pressure has got to him at times throughout the the season. You know, I think, I think as fans, you kind of grow accustomed to, you know, what your team has been doing in the past decade. And the facts are the Warriors have won four championships in that time. And as fans, you kind of get used to, being at the pointy end of an NBA season, being in the NBA finals, playing in the biggest games. And so the pressure on players to kind of you know replicate that and get back to that point, particularly when you've got a franchise legend, one of the greatest players of all time in Stephen Curry, like the pressure is amped up. And I think, you know, clearly players feel that. And I think Clay might've felt that at times. I think everyone might've felt that at times over the last couple of seasons. And then if you look at Orlando, like a team who's been bereft of, of championship success or uh, complete championship success or and really playoff success 
in general over the last few years. Like to them, not trying to be disrespectful to their fans or anything, but their fans are going to be really, really happy with, you know, even just one playoff victory probably next season is a step forward for them in the right direction. Obviously, Paolo's really young. He's, he's got plenty of time. And so I don't think there's necessarily the desperation. Let's say, let's sign Clay to a big contract. Let's bring him in and hope that he's, you know, the guy that can carry us to an NBA championship. I don't think that's the case. I think it's, okay, let's bring Clay in. He's going to be an additive to what we're doing already and what we're building already. And that doesn't necessarily mean we have to fast track things to winning a chip anytime soon. But if we can win a playoff series or two, you know, continue to develop the, the duo of France and Paolo and kind of Clay bring him in around that. I think it makes a lot of sense for both parties. I think from a Clay perspective, it makes sense to kind of get out of the pressure cooker that is the Warriors, that is the expectation of while you've got Steph Curry, you should be competing for a championship. Get out of there and go to a young team who are on the rise. Uh, I think it would be I think it would be good for him. Uh, and I think Warrior fans should be concerned that the Magic are a a destination that he might be interested in because I think it ticks all the boxes. <laughs> it ticks all the boxes, perhaps more so than the Warriors, aside from the fact that he's got all the history in Golden State. Like if you're looking at it purely from a future perspective, I think if you're Clay, you might pick Orlando. I think you would. But he's obviously got the history at the Warriors, the desire to be a, a one franchise player throughout his entire career. That's going to be a big drawing factor still. And so is that enough? I still think yes, but we'll wait and see. The uh, Mavericks are the other one, which the Athletic Sam Amick reported last week. is another team, probably them and Orlando, the two teams most strongly linked to Clay at the moment. Uh, would be a bit more difficult given they don't have the, the cap room to sign him outright as a free agent. It would have to be a sign and trade, which obviously gets a little bit more complicated a little bit more unlikely. Again, makes sense for Dallas. Like you look at their game one loss to the Clippers, everyone outside of Luca and Kyrie shot three, 15, 20% from three point range in that game. They just don't have guys that are consistent enough from beyond the arc. Like PJ Washington takes the fourth most threes on the team. He's shooting less than 32% since his arrival in Dallas. Tim Hardaway Jr. We kind of see as a guy who's a really good three point shooter. He's not really an elite three-point shooter by any means. Like he's a guy that can heat up and have periods where he looks like a great shooter, but realistically, he's thirty-six percent, which is like league average on his career, and thirty-five point three percent this season. Like not a great three-point shooter necessarily. Yes, he can get hot, but Clay, who is one of the obviously one of the greatest shooters of all time, who even on a down year this season still has percent on really high volume. If you look at their their three-point shooters on the season by percentage. Dante Exum shot 49%. Cool. He took two threes a game. And I, lo- I love Dante again as an Australian. His resurgence in the NBA has been fun to watch, fantastic to watch. Absolutely amazing. Uh, he's not a th- he's not a three-point shooter. He's a steady three-point shooter now. He's been able to you know work his way into a position where he can take and make open threes. He can take and make big shots, which he has for the Mavericks uh, over uh, different points this season. But he takes two threes a game. He's not a high volume three point shooter by any means. So again, you can see why the Mavs would have interest in Clay Thompson. Absolutely, uh, I just don't th- like. And again, you would argue from Clay's perspective that hey, Dallas are in closer to the championship contention than the Warriors are. Like you can understand that. I just think things get a little bit complicated with the whole sign and trade scenario. I think uh, things get a little bit complicated in terms of what you know, he can necessarily be offered or whatever else. Like it's, yeah, it's just a wait and see game there. It's certainly, you wouldn't rule out Dallas by any means. I'll have interest in him. Uh, But again, it's about the desire, I suppose, for for Clay to remain with the Warriors. And I think that will ultimately happen depending on, obviously, whether or not the Warriors respect him enough to give him an initial offer or whatever, or an ending, an end offer that is, you know, befitting of who he is as a franchise legend. And, uh, it's going to be hard for the franchise to necessarily balance that because, you know, you see a report from Zach Lowe last week that says both Clay's management and the Warriors have taken notice of uh, the four-year $135 million contract handed out to Drew Holiday and the Celtics. That's like if Clay and his management come to Joe Lacob and Mike Dunleavy, the general manager, and say, 
we want in excess of $100 million, I'm not going to blame the franchise if they walk away from that. And they say, like, look, you're a franchise legend. You're one of the greatest players to ever suit up this uniform. Number 11, we are going to hang it in the jersey in the coming years. But we're not paying that. And I would I'd completely understand if the franchise did that. So I don't know why, like, that report, like, that concerned me because there's just no way players should be getting anywhere near $135 million. You shouldn't be getting in excess of $100 million. I think, personally, I actually think it will take more than what some fans think. Like, I think some fans think uh, they'll get in for, like, we'll, we'll get in for less than 20, uh, and it might be, like, two years less than 40. I think it would be more than that. I would, wouldn't be surprised if it's closer to 30 than it is 20. So, you know, two year 55. Now, a lot of people say, you know, that's a lot of money and that's overs for Clay Thompson at this point of his career. Again, like if we just remove the Kings game, right? Like it's one game. If we just remove it as disastrous and as big a nightmare as it was, if you remove that again, second half of the season, 20 points on 42% three-point shooting on the season still, 17 points a game on 38.7% three-point shooting. Like teams are going to pay for that. And a team like the Magic are going to come in and say, yeah, for a couple of years, we'll give you $30 million for that. And so the Warriors are going to have to try and get somewhere near that mark for for him to, to put his hand up and say, yeah, I'm, I'm willing to come back. And, you know, they'll get a, a, a semi-discount probably on what he could get elsewhere, but it can't be that big of a difference. And so I think two year 55 might be the answer. And a lot of people might laugh at that. I just think, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to pay what the market is willing to offer, and I think the Magic could come in uh, with a big deal, and obviously Clay's manager are probably going to use that as leverage. Uh, maybe he gets a, a third year on top of that to slightly reduce the money. Maybe it's three years seventy, three years seventy-five, uh, rather than you know two years fifty-five kind of thing. Uh, I don't know, but that's I, I'm still hopeful. Obviously, as you know, I'm you know, Clay's my favorite player ever. I'm obviously still optimistic and hopeful uh, that he will you know, re-sign with the Warriors and be here for years to come. But I do think that there has to be some concern based on these links with the Magic and the Mavericks and how much they actually make sense as just purely basketball fits for him. Uh, and, of course, the press conference last week, which just didn't really give any reassurances whatsoever. Uh, but that's kind of the latest on Clay at the moment. Let me know what you think Clay's worth, what you think... Uh, I think there's a difference in what Clay's worth and what the Warriors are going to pay him. So, like, let me know what you think he's worth and let me know what you think the Warriors or any other team will ultimately pay him because I think he's going to get paid overs on what his value is. But I think that's just what the Warriors are going to have to do to be able to retain him because I think the Magic are, are going to be willing to pay overs uh, if he's at all interested in going to them. So, uh, interesting. Going to be uh, a fascinating offseason for the Warriors. We're going to get into it plenty more moving forward. I'll do some of these kind of updates on the playoffs as well, particularly if you know former Warriors like Dante continue to progress through and have big moments like he did today, which, again, was fantastic to see. Other than that, guys, uh, leave some comments for me in the YouTube video. That would be uh, fantastic. If you've got any questions at all about the Warriors season, about uh, the off-season for agency trades, then let me know. Uh, otherwise, also happy to read out just your general thoughts as well. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel already, that would be greatly appreciated. You can follow me at POC252. That's P-O-K. 252 on x slash twitter uh, you can follow us on apple Podcasts and spotify as well it's nearly 10 p.m my time so uh, i'm gonna go i'm gonna edit this i'll get it up for early u.s time and uh, otherwise i'll see you in a couple of days cheers guys